This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So my pleasure to introduce the uh, next speaker, Dr. Marion Peters. Uh, Marion is really renowned uh, hepatologist in so many areas, including autoimmune hepatitis, uh, hepatitis B, HIV, and liver disease. And uh, she's also a uh, you know really great uh, chief of our outpatient liver clinic and being the director of hepatology research. So uh, Marion is a really entertaining speaker and I look forward to the talk on autoimmune liver disease. Thank you very much, Francis. It's an absolute pleasure to see Tony here, and I'm definitely in favor of preserving the ravens. <laughs> and maybe the lost elixir of youth. <laughs> so I am going to give you an update on autoimmune liver disease, because finally, after 40 years, there is an update. Um, so I'm going to start with two cases. One is a 13-year-old girl who presents with jaundice and abdominal pain with a positive ANA, smooth muscle antibody, high IgG, and liver biopsy showed lots of uh, lymphocytes and a few plasma cells, a couple of EOs, and not much fibrosis. She had an MRCP, which is the new recommendation for patients with autoimmune hepatitis to rule out biliary tract disease, and it was normal. She had negative viral hepatitis serologies and had a mixed cholestatic hepatocellular picture. The second patient is a 17-year-old with new onset jaundice whose biopsy showed lots of plasma cells, but we didn't have an IgG or autoantibodies that I could find. She was diagnosed with autoimmune hepatitis, placed on steroids and azathioprine, she had multiple flares, according to her notes, and had tried on multiple different medications, and the doctors decided she was non-compliant. Then she had a biopsy seven years later that showed she'd gone from no fibrosis to cirrhosis and still had plasma cells, had a meld of 15, had varices, and got a transplant at UCSF a few months ago. So what about the pathogenesis of autoimmune diseases? We know there's a genetic component with HLA associations, depending on what part of the world you're in. There's certainly an immunoregulatory component with abnormalities in Tregs and CD4 and CD8 cells. There's an association with other autoimmune diseases, but at most this only explains half of the incidence of the prevalence of the disease. So there are environmental factors, and as early, I mean, McFarlane Burnett won a Nobel Prize for suggesting infections could induce autoimmune disease and the B cell uh, producing antibodies. Xenobiotics has been shown by a number of individuals to induce uh, autoimmunity with molecular mimicry, and even the hepatic microenvironment is involved because the liver is really a very uh, increased site of, uh, auto of inflammatory and immunologic cells. So we characterize autoimmune hepatitis by the presence of autoantibodies, by hypergammaglobulinemia, and now IgG, by the characteristic histopathology, which is plasma cells, interface hepatitis. And remember that up to 40% of, in, of individuals on presentation will have cirrhosis. 
It's much more common in women. There's a bimodal age distribution in teenage girls and postmenopausal women. There's often a family history of autoimmunity. And as I said before, there's HLA association and the commonest haplotype in the US is uh, A1B8DR3. And here, if I can work this fabulous thing, Mm, yes. Here is interface hepatitis with the lymphocytes and plasma cells spilling out into the lobules around the hepatocytes. Here are the plasma cells with their eccentric nuclei. Remember, in children, predominantly, autoimmune hepatitis can present with multinucleated giant cells. So if you see giant cell hepatitis, it may be autoimmune. And in fulminant hepatitis, you may not have elevated gamma globulin. And you also see cholestasis, as shown here. And somewhere here, but I can't see it on, oh, there, here. This is from Miele Vergani, who's written a lot about autoimmune hepatitis. You can see interface hepatitis, no clear distinction between the portal tract and the hepatocytes, with positive smooth muscle antibody and positive antinuclear antibody. So what about the autoantibodies? Type 1 hepatitis is characterized by antinuclear antibody to nuclear antigens by smooth muscle antibody, which is to F-actin, but also to something else that we're not quite sure about. And at least 20% of the antibody is not to F-actin. Uh, soluble liver antigen was thought to be a type 3 autoimmune hepatitis, and it's now shown that it's really part of type 1, but is more severe. And the antigen is the UGA repressor protein or tRNA-associated protein. Type 2 liver kidney microsomal is the antigen is CYP2D6. None of these antibodies are specific. 95% of patients with type 1 autoimmune are positive for ANA and SMA. I've noticed that a lot of uh, patients coming in have had uh, a, uh, SMA done by F-actin ELISA. And while it's positive in 75% of patients with autoimmune type 1, it can also be positive in autoimmune type 2, PBC, PSC, viral hepatitis, and celiac disease. The smooth, the old-fashioned immunofluorescent smooth muscle uh, antibody is less sensitive, but it's actually more specific. So often we'll repeat SMA when the patient comes in. But just to remind you, F-actin doesn't tell you it's autoimmune type 1. LKM antibodies. They're in a small subset of patients with autoimmune type 2, and also can be in young children who have the uh, APOSEP, autoimmune poly polyendocrinopathy, candidiasis, and ectodermal dystrophy. It's also and up against uh, various CYP antigens. But there are other liver kidney microsomal antibodies, such as M2, which is against a different CYP and is in response to um, an NSAID, tenoleic acid. And type 3 is induced by uh, the presence of delta or chronic hepatitis D. And that's against uridine diphosphate glucuronyl transferase. So there's a very mixed pattern. Liver cytosol antibody you'll read about, and there's a reference in your handout, is also a, against a different antigen highly expressed in the liver and can be seen on its own or in patients with LKM1. Why is, is this important? Well, it's important because there's a different uh, prevalence of the disease, a different incidence, and a different outcome. Patients with type 1, as I said, are uh, predominantly smooth muscle antinuclear. They're bimodal, whereas type 2 is almost exclusively seen in young and teenage children. Both are more common in women. 
Both have elevated gamma globulin, or IgG, but the type 1 is higher. They have different HLA associations with DR in type 1, but also against complement as uh, associations in type 2. They both are very commonly associated with other autoimmune diseases, and type 1 is much more steroid responsive than type 2, and type 2 much more rapidly progresses to cirrhosis and liver transplantation. You probably all remember from some distant past this dreadful list of positive and negative ways to diagnose autoimmune hepatitis. You read it, it goes in one ear and out the other. You never have it with you when you see the patient, so it's pretty useless. But here it is. Um, and I won't go into it because I never use it, never have, but here's the criteria. You can score three if it's plus three points if it's female, high IgD, uh, GG, this is uh, positive ANA, high titer, negative viral hepatitis, and a consistent biopsy. This is not with polys, piecemeal necrosis. And fewer if you're female. You lose points if it's predominantly cholestatic. And uh, positive AMA and viral hepatitis positive. And if you add it up and it's over 15, that's classically autoimmune hepatitis. But if you have everything in the three lane, you probably don't need to worry. And about five years ago, the same group, the International Autoimmune Hepatitis Group, realized that after 20 years, no one was using their brilliant uh, algorithm and came up with a simple one only requiring four things, which is less than one hand. One is autoantibody, two is IgG, three is histology, and four is lack of viral hepatitis. So if you have low titer autoantibodies, you get one point. If you have high titer, you get two points. If you have elevated IgG or gamma globulin, you get one point. If you have over 10% elevated, you get two points. And if you're classic autoimmune on biopsy, you get two. And, uh, and consistent with, which is what most pathologists wimp out at, you get one. If you have no viral hepatitis, and that includes IgE now, then you get two points. More than seven or is definite, and six is probable. The only problem with this um, simplified score is it doesn't work very well with fulminant failure, because often the IgG or gamma globulin is not elevated. And the second point is children require lower titers of autoantibodies to be positive. So what about treatment for autoimmune hepatitis? Well, 40 years ago, the first studies came out showing in randomized controlled studies, prednisone was better than placebo. This is 54 patients treated for four years. And at 72 months, 86% on in the corticosteroid group were alive, compared to 44% in the control group. Another study compared prednisone versus azathioprine for, I know I put all these in the wrong order, I apologize, but they can be sent to you if you need them. I just had a moment of truth that I didn't have them ordered right yesterday. Um, this is comparison of prednisone and azathioprine in 1972, showing that if you have an acute flare or de novo autoimmune hepatitis, you really live longer if you get treated with prednisone rather than azathioprine. So azathioprine is useful for remission and for decreasing the amount of prednisone, but it's not useful on its own. This is an, uh, another slide that I think is important and one we often forget. IgG is useful for monitoring response in autoimmune hepatitis. And here is 
the decrease in gamma globulin with time in treatment with prednisone, which as I showed you in the last slide, increases survival compared to azathioprine. So we actually use IgG to monitor response. So after 1972, nothing happened for nearly 40 years until finally someone decided to do another randomized controlled trial, and that was Michael Mans looking at the effect of budesonide versus prednisone in autoimmune hepatitis patients. And his group was much stricter than the old studies. Remember, the old studies, Ian Mackay was still working out LE cells, we didn't have all the autoantibodies, we certainly didn't have non-A, non-B hepatitis. So all they had was plasma cells, some uh, anti-nuclear antibodies, and response to steroids with ALT. So Michael Manz's group required a biochemical remission which is AST and ALT within the normal range, plus lack of steroid side effects. That was the complete response. As you know, budesonide is a glu glucocorticoid with greater than 90% first pass effect in the liver. And uh, providers were allowed to use azathioprine or not. The primary endpoint was normal ALT without steroid side effects. It was achieved in 47% of patients on budesonide, that's 47 out of 100, versus 18% of patients on prednisone. And at six months, a complete biochemical remission, that is normal enzymes within the normal range, plus no steroid side effect, occurred in 60% of those on budesonide, versus 39% on prednisone. Side effects in the budesonide group was lower than in the prednisone group. And everybody was randomized to budesonide versus prednisone for the first six months. Then afterwards, they were all switched to budesonide. So among the 87 patients who initially got randomized to prednisone, then got for six months, then got budesonide after six months, their steroid-specific side effects decreased from 45% to 26%. And here are the slides. In A, you can see that budesonide is better than prednisone in the percent of patients who have a complete response, normal ALT, no side effects. Um, both by intent to treat and per patient analysis. And at 12 months, you can see that the prednisone group caught up. Of course, I can't work this thing, but you can see that they look similar. If you look at B, it looks at uh, the complete response in uh, males and females, and you can see a benefit of budesonide over prednisone in both either complete response by intention to treat or by per protocol. If you look down at C, this is, oops, comparing the baseline ALT. So on C on the left is if the baseline ALT is four times the upper limit of normal, you had a better response with budesonide than prednisone. The next two are lower ALT, and again, you have a better response. Then on the right is the, uh, these two is on the left here is intent to treat and on the right is per protocol. In both of them you see a better response with budesonide. And then uh, in D it's looking at how many patients had ALT and AST within the normal range, a much more rigid outcome than had been used in any of the studies 40 years ago. And you can see that budesonide was better there in the oopsides, in the open bars compared to prednisone. However, if you just ask what they used 40 years ago, how well does uh, the treatment go under two times the upper limit of normal, there was no difference. 
So budesonide was better at actually normalizing LFTs. And this is a slide that's included in your handout showing that uh, it's good for fat and thin people and it's good for people with the classic HLA or not. It seems to be a little better in males, but the numbers were very small compared to the females. So the treatment of autoimmune, and this slide is different from your handout, I submit should now be budesonide nine milligrams a day, and once your ALT is normal, decrease it to six milligrams a day, and then when that's been normal for a few months, to three milligrams. You can't use it in patients with cirrhosis because they don't have a first pass effect, they shunt. So you can only use it in non-cirrhotics. Budesonide is now generic, but even if it weren't, I think the long-term benefit, you save money on missing out on the steroid side effects. Or if you're feeling particularly reactionary, you could stick with prednisone at two milligram per kilogram per day, decreasing. And before you do a decrease, you have to check the LFTs. The LFTs haven't come down, don't keep further decreasing. When you see the patient, I always recommended, uh, recommend checking uh, thiopurine methyltransferase. If it's normal, add azathioprine, usually about a milligram per kilogram per day. You have to check cytopenias every three months. We have very, very, uh, and patients have to go to the dermatologist to check for skin cancers. But uh, lymphoma is rare, unlike in IBD, probably because we use lower doses. Maintenance, you can continue to decrease prednisone and budesonide to stop therapy and maintain the patient on azathioprine. Clinical, for remission, you want a clinical, a biochemical, and a histologic remission. And data from Chaya and a number of others suggests that about 80% of patients will achieve remission by two years, but they'll relapse after withdrawal of treatment, probably because we weren't rigid enough in the ALT that equaled remission, and not everybody was getting a biopsy to show they had a normal liver. What about other alternatives? The pediatricians always start mycophenolate mofetil based on no randomized controlled study, but they're happy doing it. Uh, Prograph has been studied, uh, but not randomized. Cyclosporin, an oxazolone derivative, and all of them have some benefit. When we find we're not getting a response from a patient, we switch them to CELSEP, we change them to Prograph, we change them to cyclosporin. But I think what we're really saying we should be thinking of transplant. Rituximab has certainly been used in patients with high IgGs to eradicate B cells and has been successfully reported in patients who have other autoimmune phenotypes. This is a slide with the autoantibodies, comparing them to PBC, PSC, IgG4, and autoimmune cholangiopathy. To remind you that PBC can have a positive ANA and SMA, but it's the AMA that is positive. It's not worth doing AMA in a patient with a patacellular disease. It just gives money to somebody. Um, carbonic anhydrase antibody has been in one report shown to be positive in autoimmune pancreatitis, but not in PSC, and it's not widely available. The best test for PBC is AMA and IgM. The best test for autoimmune is ANA, SMA, and IgG. For IgG4, the best test is IgG4. And for autoimmune cholangiopathy, 100% of them are ANA positive. The IgG is elevated, so you really distinguish between autoimmune hepatitis and autoimmune cholangiopathy by the liver biopsy. I wanted to put one slide in about autoimmune uh, pancreatitis, which responds beautifully to steroids, as you all well know, but there are many extra hepatic uh, presentations in many different or organs. 
and to diagnose autoimmune PSC, uh, sorry, PSC, you need characteristic biliary imaging findings, elevation of IgG4, which may be elevated even in the absence of elevated total IgG. You may or may not have other coexistent IgG4-related disease. You'll have characteristic histopathology of PSC. The effectiveness of therapy is really an issue because autoimmune pancreatitis responds very well to steroids, but autoimmune PSC may or may not. And to remind you, you can also have autoimmune hepatitis, not PSC associated with autoimmune pancreatitis. In that case, the patient has a normal imaging of the biliary ducts, elevated IgG4, characteristic biopsy, and in that patient, steroids work. So to get back to my patient, who was, as you remember, the young teenager with autoantibodies, high IgG, plasma cells, normal MRCP, mixed cholestatic, and her father had celiac disease, her grandfather had thyroid disease, reminding you to do a family history, talk to the patient, lash out. She responded beautifully to budesonide with normalizing her ALT and IgG. And then five years later, she developed abdominal pain that was really classic of cholecystitis that I couldn't understand. And after wandering around for a while, Chris Fries took out her gallbladder, which was just full of plasma cells just sheets of plasma cells. Her IgG4 was elevated, and remember her MRCP when she was 13 was completely normal. Now it showed PSC. And then a month ago, she lost her response to budesonide. We did an MRCP that looked kind of nasty, so we put her on prednisone 40 for a month, and then last Friday, she had an ERCP which showed this very long, ugly-looking stricture. So she had classical autoimmune hepatitis with a normal ERCP, fulfilling all the criteria, but she transitioned to uh, biliary tract disease, which is well-described in the literature. And all young individuals with autoimmune hepatitis should have MRCPs to evaluate their biliary tract. What about the other young lady who had plasma cells? Autoantibodies, we don't know at diagnosis. We do know later they were negative. Negative viral hepatitis, no IgG available. Given steroids, multiple medicines, rapidly got worse. Had plasma cells and uh, cirrhosis on her latest biopsy with varices and got a transplant. Well, she turned out to have a positive LKM, so I have been telling the fellows that I'd shoot anybody that did an LKM antibody, because this is the first one since I've been in San Francisco for 15 years, and I had two in St. Louis in the last 15 years, and they were both teenagers. So, if you want to diagnose autoimmune hepatitis, you have to rule out viral hepatitis. And I submit you should screen with an ANA, smooth muscle, and IgG. If they're elevated, do a liver biopsy. If it's autoimmune hepatitis, you can then do other autoantibodies depending on the age and whether the labs are mixed cholestatic hepatocellular or purely hepatocellular. If they're cholestatic and the biopsy looks cholestatic, then do the IgM and AMA. Always do an MRCP if it's cholestatic or a young autoimmune hepatitis. And to remind us, we need to be doing IgG4 levels. And I think the best long-term value is using budesonide and azathioprine in, as first line. Then you don't have the risk of diabetes, obesity, all the terrible steroid side effects in young people, which really affects their own body image and their develop at a critical time in their development. And in older people, you don't want them having all these side effects and bone disease. So in summary, 
It's a predominant disease of women with a bimodal age distribution, but it can be any age. I recently had an 84-year-old. There's often a family history of autoimmunity. It's characterized by autoantibodies and high uh, IgG. Classic plasma cell interface hepatitis and cirrhosis is common, not on, uncommon. The majority respond to treatment, and you should monitor not just with ALT, but with IgG. Survival is excellent with treatment and horrible without. And uh, m many will relapse after withdrawal of treatment, but if you have normal ALT and normal biopsy, it's less. Thank you very much. Yes. So the question is, if someone's completely normalized, do you always do a liver biopsy or would you ever try to stop therapy? I think it depends. If you have a young individual, 28, 30, who wants to have children, who wants to get off all medication, who's prepared to take the risk of going back on therapy of a relapse. Now we have budesonide. They don't have to face the 60-40 of prednisone again. So in that patient, they, you discuss it with the patient. They may say, let's just stop and see how I go. And if they have to have a normal ALT and a normal IgG for at least 6 to 12 months, some studies, Chaya suggested under two times normal for two years. But I think you need normal normal. I have a patient who has statin-induced autoimmune hepatitis who was F3-4 on a biopsy. I'd never stop her. She takes 25 of azathioprine a day. Now, is it passing the pill under her nose? I don't know. I feel better. Her labs are perfect. I don't want to mess with it. One quick, one quick question. Uh, how about ursodiol in addition to the azathioprine um, prednisone? So the data for URSO in autoimmune hepatitis, it does nothing. For autoimmune cholangiopathy, it does nothing. For crossover syndrome or PBC-like picture, it is clearly of benefit. And uh, recent ASLD, I was telling Tony, they had a, uh, a multi-center group of nearly 900 patients. And over 15 years, they clearly showed the benefit of ursodiol at 15 milligrams per kilogram per day in decreasing uh, death, decreasing complications, and decreasing need for transplant. So if someone has what looks like a PBC-like picture, it's very reasonable to put them on urso. Okay, great. Thank you very much.